From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Oh, oh, sorry. I forgot that's when I'm supposed to come in. Hi, welcome back. If this is your first time, I I hope that doesn't disturb you. It's kind of what happens around here. But if you are back for another visit, thank you for coming on back. In episode 22, now that I've figured out that I'm supposed to be doing the podcast right now instead of smoking a joint, in episode 22, we are going to stuff a whole lot of interesting cannabis trivia down your ear. We'll start with a story from leafly.ca about five wacky Canadian cannabis laws that are across our country. We all know there's a lot of them, and we're going to tell you about five of them, thanks to Leafly. We're also going to look at how those new laws and how they are applied in some provinces have actually set an even higher stigma against cannabis than existed before legalization. This is a story from theleafnews.com on the not-so-lit future for outdoor festivals in Manitoba this year. And then it's been a while since we've talked about terpenes. I found a great article on Canacon.org that explains the top 15 terps found in cannabis. Plus, we'll finish off with a story from back in the radio days about smoking a joint that has a few twists and turns, shall we say. All of that and more is coming your way on episode 22 of the Cannabis Podcast. And one of the first things I wanted to talk about today was the wacky Canadian cannabis laws. And we have talked about some of them before, and many of you have experienced them in your own particular province, because I know they vary across the country. So I thought it very interesting that a week or so ago, Leafly came out with this article. It's written by Harrison Jordan at leafly.ca. And that's the article I'm going to be quoting as we talk about that. Five wacky Canadian cannabis laws that you did not know existed. Now, we all know October 17th was when cannabis was legalized across our country. But as we've already discussed, the laws do vary from province to province. Many of the regulations are as expected, touching on the who, how much, and where legal cannabis can be purchased, possessed, and consumed. But there are still some, shall we say, odd cannabis-related laws on the books. And that's why Leafly scoured Canadian cannabis laws and found five of the wackiest. So thanks to Leafly for digging these up. This one I just found rather weird. In Alberta, dispensaries are banned from forcing you to buy cannabis. Now, as the article points out, or rather asks, Have you ever been to a legal dispensary that forced you to purchase something even if you intended on leaving empty-handed? Yeah, us neither. That hasn't stopped the government of Alberta from explicitly prohibiting it. The provincial law states that no cannabis licensee or employee or agent of a cannabis licensee may require or demand, by force or otherwise, that a person buy cannabis in the licensed premises. I can't believe this exists. The provision was copied directly from the province's liquor rules that apply to bars and servers. Now, that makes sense. Imagine a scenario where a bar owner might enforce a drink minimum to occupy the bar. Understand that. But at cannabis stores, however, that would be a rather new phenomenon. I'm sorry you can't come into the store unless you buy at least a quarter ounce. (laughs) Wow. Okay, so that's the first one we found. Now, in Quebec... Nobody can sell cannabis accessories and make even a passing reference to cannabis. And I remember when this first happened, there was just all kinds of talk about it. You know, simply having a bong with the image of a marijuana leaf was something you couldn't display. So here's the details from the article. According to provincial law, businesses in Quebec cannot sell cannabis accessories that contain a name, logo, distinguishing guise, design, image, or slogan that is directly associated with cannabis. In the months following legalization, it's been reported that Quebec inspectors are coming down hard on head shops while enforcing this provision. As a result, stores have purged all kinds of product from their stock, including rolling trays and T-shirts brandished with everything from blunts to 420. One store even said that inspectors don't agree on where they draw the line. Well, British Columbia is not immune to some wacky laws as well. This one kind of surprised me. In British Columbia, businesses can't advertise themselves as a destination to visit after consuming cannabis. What? 
I mean, when you think about it, all of beautiful British Columbia is worthy of visiting after you've consumed cannabis. So there will be no more advertising for the province of British Columbia, apparently. From the article, it says, think your entertainment venue would be a fun spot to visit following a few tokes? Well, tough news if your business is based in B.C., because provincial law explicitly prohibits this. You cannot market, advertise, or promote any establishment as a place to spend time after consuming cannabis. The provision also prohibits businesses from allowing consumption on site, which means that beyond barring vape lounges, you can't invite the public to eat infused brownies at your business. The article says, sorry, golf courses, arcades, and IMAX theaters. And now in Ontario, I, I don't understand this one. In Ontario, stores can't put vaporizers on display. Just because you don't see vaporizers on store shelves at your favorite Ontario head shop, it doesn't mean they're out of stock. A provincial law first passed in 2015, even before legalization, clamped down on the display and sale of electronic cigarettes in stores. The law is being equally enforced on cannabis vaporizers due to the Smoke-Free Ontario Act's broad definition of e-cigarettes. That's despite the fact that the Act was introduced to deal with e-cigarettes. Cannabis was never mentioned in the legislation's text when it was first introduced. Inspectors in Ontario now enforce this e-cigarette law with respect to cannabis vaporizers, visiting head shops across the province to make sure store owners are operating in accordance with law. The alternative? Stores can still provide a catalog of their vaporizers for sale, which the customer can then pursue. So if you don't see a display of vaporizers, ask the store to be sure. There may just be a binder full of them. And this is one that kind of applies all across the country. We'll finish with this. Possession of out-of-province cannabis products is only allowed in limited quantities. Something I had never really even thought of or, or considered before. The Cannabis Act allows individuals to possess an unlimited amount of cannabis in private as long as the possession is not for an unlawful purpose such as selling. Now, one might think it would be fine to store cannabis products that were legally purchased in other provinces, but that's actually prohibited by the Excise Act of 2001, which bars individuals from possessing purchased cannabis products if they are not stamped with an excise duty stamp in the name of the province they are situated in. Now, on a positive note, the Department of Finance instituted an amendment to the Excise Act, which allows individuals to personally possess up to 30 grams of purchased dried cannabis or its equivalent in accordance with the Cannabis Act, regardless of whether it bears a stamp from another province. The Excise Act legislation is primarily intended to go after non-compliant producers and tax sheets. So we're hopeful we won't see Canadians charged for excise tax offenses when their activity otherwise complies with the Federal Cannabis Act and provincial laws. And of course, our country for years has had provincial issues. Just the whole idea we used to talk about wine moving across our country and beer moving from province to province. How could cannabis be left out of that particular equation? So there you go. Five rather wacky, weird laws across our country that have existed after legalization back on October 17th. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. We have talked about terpenes a lot on the Cannabis Podcast. Pretty well, I think, ever since we started. We've discovered and started talking about all the various and wonderful terpenes inside of cannabis. And today, I'm going to kind of summarize a lot of what we've talked about before. We did an episode on myrcene. We did one, we talked about geraniol. So today, there's 15 of them. I'm going to give you a summary of to kind of give you a, an equivalent of the Terpene 101 for cannabis. And this is thanks to a website called canacon.org. That's canacon.org. And this article is from there. It's called 15 Terpenes Cannabis Explained. Now, as mentioned in their earlier terpene series, there are more than 100 terpenes in just one cannabis flower. And today we're going to cover some of the well-known terpenes, which you will find in most legal cannabis. Myrcene. We've talked about that many, many times before. And myrcene is the most abundant terpene in cannabis, which is where it's mostly found in nature. In fact, one study showed that myrcene makes up as much as 65% of total terpene profile in some strains. Myrcene smell often reminds you of earthy, musky notes resembling cloves. Also, it has a fruity, red, grape-like aroma. Now, strains that contain about 0.5% of this terpene are usually indicas with sedative effects. 
It's also been reported that myrcene is useful in reducing inflammation and chronic pain, which is why it's usually recommended as a supplemental during cancer treatments. Strains that are rich in myrcene are Skunk XL, White Widow, and Special Kush. And here's a bonus tip from the article. If you want to experience a stronger buzz for marijuana, get yourself a mango and eat it about 45 minutes before smoking. And I have been using that tip with my customers in my role as a bud tender for a long time. Most people have not heard about it. And of course, it works because mangoes also contain myrcene. Limonene is the second most abundant terpene in all cannabis strains, but not all strains necessarily have it. As its name says, limonene gives strains a citrusy smell that resembles lemons, which is no surprise as all citrus fruits contain large amounts of this compound. Limonene is used in cosmetics and also in cleaning products. For therapeutic purposes, limonene is known to improve mood and reduce stress. Researchers also found it to have antifungal and antibacterial properties, and one research even found it to have a role in reducing tumor size. Strains that have lemon or sour in their name are usually rich in limonene. High levels of limonene can be found in strains like OG Kush, Sour Diesel, Super Lemon Haze, Durban Poison, Jack Herrera, and Jack the Ripper. And that brings us to linalool. This terpene is the most responsible for the recognized marijuana smell with its spicy and floral notes. Linalool is also found in lavender, mint, cinnamon, and coriander. What's interesting is that just like those aromatic herbs, it has very strong sedative and relaxing properties. Patients suffering from arthritis, depression, seizures, insomnia, and even cancer have all found aid in the amazing terpene Little Lul. Some well-known Little Lul strains are Amnesia Haze, Special Kush, Lavender, L.A. Confidential, and O.G. Shark. And now I come to Caryophylline, and I have also heard an alternate pronunciation of this, so I'll throw that out as well, and Caryophylline, so Caryophylline or Caryophylline. Either way, it's best known for its spicy and peppery note. I prefer caryophylline. It's found in black pepper, cinnamon, cloves, and spices like oregano, basil, and rosemary. Beta caryophylline binds to CB2 receptors, which makes it an ingredient in anti-inflammatory topicals and creams. Caryophylline is the only terpene that binds to cannabinoid receptors. Besides its analgesic and anti-anxiety properties, some studies have found that caryophylline has some very promising properties when it comes to alcoholism rehabilitation. A group of scientists performed research on mice and found that this terpene reduces voluntary intake of alcohol. They even recommend caryophylline for treating alcohol withdrawal symptoms. You can benefit from caryophylline by using strains like Super Silver Haze, Skywalker, and Rockstar. Maybe that's why Rockstar has always been one of my favorite strains. Things are starting to make a whole lot more sense as we look at all these wonderful cannabis terpenes. How about alpha-pinene and beta-pinene? These two terpenes, surprisingly not, smell like pine trees, and that's also where they can be found in large amounts. There are other plants rich in pinene. They are include rosemary, orange peels, basil, parsley, and, of course, cannabis. Like many other, pinene terpenes have an anti-inflammatory effect on humans, but more importantly, they also help improve airflow and respiratory functions, while also helping to reduce memory loss related to THC. I know that this can sound weird because we're talking about cannabis, but if the strain is rich in alpha and beta pinene, it can actually help with asthma. Pinene also helps patients with arthritis, Crohn's disease, and cancer. You can find pinene in strains like Jack Hare, Strawberry Cough, Blue Dream, Island Sweet Skunk, Dutch Treat, and Romulan. Alpha bisabolol has a pleasant floral aroma and can also be found in the chamomile flower. This terpene found its use primarily in the cosmetics industry, but lately it's got the attention of researchers since it showed medical benefits, especially in cannabis. alpha bisabolol proved to be effective in treating bacterial infections and wounds, and is a great antioxidant with anti-irritation and analgesic properties. It can be found in strains like Pink Kush, Headband, OG Shark, and ACDC. Now, eucalyptol, also known as cineol. Eucalyptol is the primary terpene of, guess what, the eucalyptus tree. It has recognizable minty and cool tones in its smell, but most cannabis strains do not contain large amounts of it. it usually makes up around 0.06% of a strain's complete terpene profile. This terpene has been used in cosmetics as well as medicine, 
And when it comes to its medical value, eucalyptol relieves pain but also slows the growth of bacteria and fungus. Although it's still in the early stages in research, this terpene has shown much promising effects on Alzheimer's as well. Eucalyptol can be found in super silver haze and headband. And now a secondary terpene, transneurolido. This one is a secondary terpene found mostly in flowers like jasmine, lemongrass, and tea tree oil. The smell of transneurolidol reminds of a mixture of rose, citrus, and apples, and can be described in general as woody, citrus, and floral. Transneurolidol is best known for its antiparasitic, antioxidant, antifungal, anti-cancer, and antimicrobial properties. Strains like Island Jack Herer, Sweet Skunk, and Skywalker OG are rich in neurolidol. Cumuline. Cumuline was the first terpene found in hops. Its aroma contains earthy, woody, and spicy notes. Besides cannabis, it can also be found in clove, sage, and black pepper. It has a variety of medical properties. Early research has shown humulene to be anti-proliferative, meaning it prevents cancer cells from growing. Also, it proved to be effective in suppressing appetite, making it a potential weight loss tool. And furthermore, it also reduces inflammation, relieves pain, and fights bacterial infections. Where will you find humulene strains? Well, you'll find some in White Widow, Headband, Girl Scout Cookies, Sour Diesel, Pink Kush, and Skywalker OG. Delta-3 Carine. This terpene is found in a number of plants like rosemary, basil, bell peppers, cedar, and pine. Its aroma is sweet and resembles the smell of a cypress tree. When it comes to the medical side of carine, it seems to be mostly beneficial in healing broken bones. And that gives hope to patients suffering from osteoporosis, arthritis, and even fibromyalgia. What's also interesting about this terpene is that it stimulates our memory and helps memory retention, which is a major point in finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Our next terpene, camphene. The best way to describe the smell of camphene is fir needles, musky earth, and damp woodlands. Camphene aroma is often mistaken with myrcene, which is that trademark marijuana smell as most of us know it. From the medical point of view, camphene has great potential. When mixed with vitamin C, it becomes a powerful antioxidant. It's widely used in conventional medicine as a topical for skin issues like eczema or psoriasis. It also shows great potential in its ability to lower the levels of cholesterol and triglycerides in the blood, further lowering the risk of cardiovascular diseases. You'll find camphene in ghost OG, strawberry, banana, and Mendocino perps. Borneo. With its herbal minty scent, it can be found in herbs like rosemary, mint, and camphor. This terpene is a good natural insect repellent, which makes it great in preventing diseases like the West Nile virus being passed by ticks, fleas, and mosquitoes. One study found that Borneo kills breast cancer cells. It's also widely used in Chinese traditional medicine, in acupuncture to be precise. Strains high in Borneo are amnesia haze, golden haze, and K13 haze. Terpeno. The aroma of terpeno can be best described as floral-like, reminiscent of lilacs, apple blossom, and perhaps a little bit citrusy. Terpeno tastes like anise and mint. It has a pleasant scent similar to lilac and is a common ingredient in perfumes, cosmetics, and flowers. It relaxes heavily, and it's usually the one responsible for the notorious couch lock effect. Medical benefits of terpeno also include antibiotic and antioxidant properties, it can be found in Girl Scout cookies, Jack Herrera, and OG Kush strains. And now, Valencine. This terpene got its name from sweet Valencia oranges, where it's been found in large amounts. With its sweet citrusy aromas and flavors, it's used as an insect repellent, too. You'll find Valencine in strains like Tangy and Ancient Orange. Geraniol. We've spoken about that before. Besides cannabis, geraniol can be found in lemons and tobacco. Its smell reminds of rose grass, peaches, and plums. It's usually used in aromatic bath products and body lotions. Geraniol also has been shown a lot of potential as a neuroprotectant and antioxidant. It's present in strains like Amnesia Haze, Great White Shark, Afghani, Headband, Island Sweet Skunk, OG Shark, and Master Kush. And that, my friends, is a very extensive list of 15 different terpenes you're going to find in your cannabis and a bit of an explanation of what each of them does and some of the strains you may find those in. As we have spoken about before, terpenes are becoming more and more important. They've always been there. It's been us that wasn't aware of them, and now we are becoming incredibly aware of them. 
and terpenes are going to become more and more important as our world of cannabis continues to evolve. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And I wanted to take a minor deviation here and just touch briefly on the BC retail scene once more. Because I decided to check the provincial site that shows all of the retail cannabis licenses that have been released. And there are more, (laughs) but there are still none in the Okanagan from a retail provincial perspective. And I also found it interesting this time, I sorted them by city name. And it puts a different perspective when you look at the licenses that have been released so far. Castlecar, for example, has three licenses associated to it for various cannabis stores. Kamloops, of course, still just has the one private store and the one provincial government store. Kimberley has two. Port Hardy has two. Salmon Arm has two. Trail has two. Vancouver has six or seven. Victoria has four. And there's still none in the Okanagan. I just thought it was worth stopping by and taking a peek at that to see if things might have changed, but I guess it's probably no surprise to anyone that there is still a glacial pace to approving the cannabis licenses in the province of British Columbia. Now, one thing I found really interesting that crossed my desk this last week, because I used to live in Winnipeg. We lived there a number of years ago, and we lived there for a few years, And during our time there, we went to the Winnipeg Folk Festival a number of times. I think probably all of the years that we were there. Really a great festival out at Birds Hill Park. And lovely venue, lovely festival. And needless to say, back when we were there, which was probably the early 80s, I guess now, there was a fair amount of cannabis smoked on the grounds during the Winnipeg Folk Festival. That was prior to legalization of cannabis, And now here's one of those wacky, weird things that happens when the cannabis laws come into effect and they actually make things worse. So I'm going to be reading from a story. This is from the Leaf Cannabis News, and it is at theleafnews.com. And of course, you'll have the link to this back on the Cannabis Podcast, where you can check it out for yourself. And that's what I'll be quoting from. And I love their their headline. Sun, songs, but no bongs. Manitoba's restrictive cannabis laws will be an expensive buzzkill for recreational weed users ticketed at summer festivals. And the article goes on to say, If you want to volunteer with the Winnipeg Folk Festival, you need to sign up for a work crew. There's the photography crew, the site safety crew, the box office crew, the schleppers crew, the first aid crew, the green room crew, and so on. But in the festival's early years, during the 1970s, Folk Fest volunteers could join another the Joint Rolling Crew, whose solemn task was rolling up cannabis cigarettes for after parties at Winnipeg's old International Inn. We put cups of joints on every table at the party, Folkfest founder Mitch Podolik recalls. What we were trying to do was just entertain the artists when they came to town. Some of them wanted hard drugs and we said no. It wasn't just performers who were lighting up joints after hours, of course. I saw the police report from a sergeant in Oak Bank, and he actually used the quote that the air turned blue, Podolik says, laughing as he reminisces about weed at the inaugural festival in 1974. There used to be guys who used to run shops out of the parking lot. They were selling out of cars. Somebody had a bar out there, too, selling mixed drinks. There was a lot of stuff that we couldn't control and didn't try to. Well, decades later... Less than a year after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberals legalized and regulated recreational marijuana, cannabis use will remain illicit at this year's festival. Even with the old federal pot prohibition repealed, festival organizers can't permit consumption on site during the Forte Festival at Birds Hill Provincial Park. Manitoba's progressive conservative government has expressly forbidden smoking or vaping cannabis in provincial parks. And anyone caught doing so? (laughs) And this is the part that I'm absolutely amazed at. And I'll give you some context first before I give you that value. Um, I saw this story prior to reading this one, and it talked about the difference between open drinking in public and the fine was roughly $240, somewhere around there. Well, if you were caught vaporizing or smoking cannabis in a provincial park, 
$672 fine. <laughs> yeah, there's still a stigma out there, folks. To quote further from the article, so in some ways, it's actually more illegal than it was before, says Festival Executive Director Lynn Scromita, because there is a heightened sense, I think, towards what people should and should not be doing. The province has implemented a ban on smoking and vaporizing cannabis in any outdoor public place, including sidewalks and streets, parks and beaches, restaurant patios and outdoor entertainment venues. The rules are tougher than the rules for tobacco smokers who are forbidden from smoking cigarettes and vaping e-cigarettes only in enclosed public spaces, such as office buildings, the common areas of residential buildings, bus shelters, and public vehicles. Scromita made clear folk festival volunteers and staff won't be on the hunt specifically for pot smoke and aren't responsible for enforcing Manitoba's consumption laws. The festival's plan is to treat marijuana smokers the same as cigarette smokers and ask them to move away from the rest of the crowd to avoid bothering others. Scromita doubts it will be an issue since the folk festival crowd tends to be well-mannered. And that's certainly been my experience over the years as well. Those who are imbibing in cannabis are certainly more well-mannered and easy to deal with than those who are imbibing in alcohol, shall we say. So there is another end result of legalization of cannabis back on October 17th, 2018 and how it's being applied in the province of Manitoba, where you can't smoke anywhere in a public place. No offense to those who are still living in, in Manitoba. I really loved my time living in Winnipeg. I thought it was a fabulous city. We really enjoyed our time there, except for the winters, of course. But I'm sure glad I don't live there now with the cannabis laws. Wow. There's just another example of some of the wacky, wacky laws that exist in our country around cannabis. <laughs> What I wanted to share with you now was uh, another reminiscence of time gone by back in the days. As I have mentioned a few times, I spent some time as a broadcaster. It's probably not a surprise to anyone who's listening. <laughs> but back in the day, when I was in radio, back in the Kootenays, I think this was back in the days of Trail, almost everybody I worked with in the radio industry, and I can't make a blanket statement because I don't speak for everybody, but I would say 80% of the people that I worked with in radio also consumed cannabis like I did. And many of us, because of the nature of the artistic aspect of the job, consumed cannabis while at work or prior to work. I told you a story about that before, where an old boss from Ontario tried to get me to come back and was shocked that I smoked a couple of joints before every show. So this was the time when I was in trail. Now, to give you a bit more context, in radio back in those days... It was not digital. Computers did not exist at that point, And everything we did was on physical magnetic tape. So we couldn't put, string a bunch of songs together in a playlist like you can do on your iPhone now or on your phone today. Back in the day, we had to use actual tape. And to get 15 minutes where you had an opportunity to either take a long bathroom break or have a lunch break or whatever you wanted to do in those 15 minutes, we had one particular cartridge of tape, and that just simply means that it was a loop of tape, continuous. If it ended, it would just start all over again. That was 15 minutes long. And at the radio station, we put together what we called our bathroom break loop. And that has Hey Jude by the Beatles, followed by Harry Chapin, W-O-L-D. So the Hey Jude was about seven minutes and 40 seconds. W-O-L-D was five minutes and 15 seconds. And it ended up with Linda Ronstadt's Love as a Rose. And it actually put a link to that uh, again back on the podcast. If you want to have a listen to that song, it's still one of my favorites. It's a Neil Young song, her version of it. And that's about two minutes and 21 seconds, somewhere around there. That was our bathroom break song. I'm working one afternoon in trail and a good buddy of mine who also worked at the station pops in the back door and says, hey, come on, let's go smoke a joint. And the way we did that, of course, is we threw in the bathroom break song. I did. We went out the back door of the radio station, expecting we were just going to hang around the back and smoke a joint. And next thing I know, we're getting into a car and there's a guy driving who's not imbibing, but he decides to start driving away, <laughs> which, okay, I'm fine. We can go somewhere else, I suppose, for a bit. But where I started to get really concerned, we had been out for a bit. And here's the indication that we had been out for a bit. Hey, Jude had finished. W-O-L-T was nearing the end. And suddenly I heard the intro to Love Us a Rose. I knew I now had two minutes and roughly 30 seconds 
to get back to the radio station, sit down on that chair, and pick it up after the song ended, because I hadn't spoken for over 15 minutes. People would be suspicious. And that's when this fella decided to head back to the radio station. That's where the twists and turns came in, as he was perhaps exceeding the speed limit just by a tiny little bit in his effort to get back to the radio station in time for me to hit that. And literally, that car stopped. I jumped out, burst through the back door of the radio station into the control room, sat down on the chair to hear the ending note of Love is a Rose. It could not have come any closer. And I'm pretty sure I was really, really out of breath when I did that break. Yes, 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 it's true. It happened. And there's another reminiscence of time from way back when, before cannabis was legalized, but of course many of us were still imbibing in cannabis back then too. And that brings us to the end of episode 22 of the Cannabis Podcast. Looking for more information on different cultivars you would like to hear or your opinions of what you heard or suggestions for what we can do in the future? Always remind you, you can get a hold of a me at info at cannabispodcast.com. Always look forward to hearing from you. And that brings us to the end of episode 22 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.